This is the type anatomy lecture for the beginning typography class. And in this lecture, I will go over some of the anatomy of letter forms and the specific terms that we use to describe different parts of letters. Typography has its own language that is used to describe certain parts of a letter form or conventions of how typography is used. Many of these words are borrowed from human and plant anatomy. You'll notice quite a few of these terms are things that you know, things like arm and leg and stem. They're words that we associate with other type of anatomical structures, but typography's really borrowed these and put them into place. And these words are really important to know because it's helpful for you to be able to see how letters are constructed and put together. That'll be very useful when you're breaking letter forms apart and looking at how you can create logo types or change things about letter form. It's also very useful because it can be helpful when you're describing certain parts of letter forms or when you're describing typefaces and talking about certain attributes. Here's Century Schoolbook. This is a typeface. Here's a full uppercase alphabet where you can see all of these intrinsic forms and these details of these letters that really make it special. This is a bracketed slab serif. So you're seeing that there's thick serifs at the bottom of the letter forms and there's a rounding as those serifs go up into the main stems and strokes. We have five basic classifications of typography. So there's sans serif on the left. It doesn't have the small feet at the bottom of the letter forms. Then we have the serif second from the left where you can see those termination strokes at the bottom of the stem and the leg and the different parts of that R. Then we have a slab serif, which is similar. We still have those termination strokes, but here they're completely square. They're blocky. You can see that rectangular form. Then we have scripts, which are based on handwriting. So that's fourth from the left. You can see the this is a more formal script based on calligraphic conventions. Then we have what we call display type. So on the right, we're actually looking at something that could be considered a slab serif typeface, but it's really something that's display. It has no purpose to be used for body copy or for reading. Its intention is really to draw attention to itself and to be used in places like headlines. So let's go through some of the anatomy here. So here's a basic structure. Here you can see a lot of these different parts of the letter forms. So all of the parts in bright blue are the, some of the terms that we'll be talking talking about where we'll be able to define exactly what these different parts of the letters are. We won't go over all of these, but this will help you see what parts have specific names and it'll help you as you're trying to identify and talk about type to practice and understand what these terms mean and how they work. Again, it'll also help you see how letters are constructed and how these different anatomical parts fit together to create these different letter forms. And you'll also be able to see where these things are shared because a lot of these terms are not always specific to one letter form itself. Here we have a capital H and we're looking at a stem. There's actually two stems and an H, but here I've highlighted the one on the right. And a stem is a downward vertical stroke that usually is thick and plays in to the construction of the letter form. So here the main pillars or columns of this H are on either side and they are both stem. A crossbar is usually a smaller stroke that connects two other strokes. So here we have this small crossbar that creates the H. Another place where you'll see a crossbar is on a capital A. It connects those two diagonal strokes that create the outer form of the A. We have counters. Counters are the negative spaces that are sometimes trapped inside of letter forms. So here we're seeing that on the lowercase a. You will also see this on O's. So both the capital and lowercase have a contained negative space inside of them, and we refer to that as a counter. The opposite of a counter is a bowl. A bowl is actually the stroke that contains the counter. It's always round in some way, but they're not always perfect circles like in O's. So here we have the lowercase a again, where you can see this bowl that actually contains the counter that's inside of it. Then we have a shoulder. A shoulder is an upward stroke. It usually connects two stems. So that's what we're seeing here. This shoulder is connecting the two stems on this end. It's a transitional stroke. So it's actually helping the letter go from one stem to another. You'll see this also on R's, but it's an upward stroke that usually connects two stems. Obviously on an R, there's a termination, but here it is connecting two stems. Then we have serifs. We talked about this when we were looking at the different classifications of type, but serifs are those strokes at the bottom and they're usually found in areas where there's a termination, so where a stroke ends or begins. We have ascenders. Those are lowercase letter forms that have a portion of the letter that go above 
the x height. So here we have an ascender, this is coming above on a lowercase d. So we have that stem on the right hand side that protrudes above most of the other lowercase letter forms. So that's an ascender. Then we have a descender. It's the opposite of an ascender. It's a stroke in a letter form that goes below the baseline. So it goes below where most of the other lowercase and capital letter forms end. So here we have it on a lowercase y. You also see this on a lowercase g and a lowercase j. Then we have an ear. An ear is the stroke that protrudes out of the bowl on a lowercase g. Gs have a lot of specific terminology that relates to them, and this is one of them. So the lowercase g has an ear, and that is always that stroke that terminates. It doesn't always look exactly like this in sans-serif typefaces. Sometimes it's more of a straight line, but that is an ear. Then we have a loop. A loop is this bottom round stroke that contains this counter in the lower part of the G. So that's a loop. We have arms. Arms are upward strokes to the right, and they do not usually transition. So this is different from a shoulder. An arm is found on a K. Here we're looking at it on a lowercase v. So this arm is this upper right stroke that we're seeing in the V. Here we have a leg. So a leg is a downward stroke. So here we're seeing it on a K. That upward stroke that is not highlighted would be another example of an arm. We have accents or diacritical marks. These are marks that appear above the letter forms that change the sound that they make. These are very important for foreign language fonts and allow people to use typefaces in different languages. You also sometimes see these forms in dictionaries or places where people are creating some kind of phonetic writing for people to understand pronunciation. We have a tail. Here we have an uppercase Q, and it has a tail, that downward stroke that comes off of the Q that helps differentiate it from a capital O is called a tail. Then we have a concept that you'll see across multiple letter forms, and that's the idea of stress or axis. So stress is really referring to where the weight on the letter form lives. So you'll notice in the example on the left, directly at the top and the bottom of that capital O is where the thinnest part of the letter form is. And the thickest parts of the letter form are on the left and the right in the middle of those downward strokes. If we look in the example on the right, we see that the thinnest parts are actually not quite at the top and the bottom. You'll see these little dotted lines I've created here to help you see where the stress is, but those thinnest parts are slightly off. They're a little bit diagonal. So we refer to this as stress. It's where the thick and thins of the letter form live. And it's also referred to as axis because it refers to the general direction that the letter forms are being portrayed in. We have a chin. That's this upper portion, this upper stroke at the bottom of a G. So that's a chin. We have a spine. The spine is the center portion of a capital and lowercase s. So it's that slightly curved portion that goes through the middle. We have a tittle. That is what we refer to as the dot on an I or a J. So lowercase letter forms that have a dot above them, we call that a tittle. We have ball terminals. That is a special kind of ending stroke. So here you're seeing that in this letter form, that round circular termination of this stroke in this five is referred to as a ball terminal. You'll sometimes see them in lowercase r's. We saw it earlier on the ear of the lowercase g. So we refer to this specific kind of terminating stroke as a ball terminal. This is a ligature. Ligatures are special characters where we've combined two characters into one. So an fi is a great example. When you type an F and an I together, these lowercase forms start to crash. The tittle on the I starts to get really close to that upward stroke on the F where that ball terminal is. So oftentimes typefaces will have an alternate. So here we're seeing an FI ligature on the right where they've redrawn and created one glyph that's together, so one character where that I's tittle is being shared by the ball terminal on that F. So when this happens, we call it a ligature. Sometimes they're very functional, like what we're seeing here, where they're solving a typographic problem, because if this on the left was very small, there's not a lot of space and it might crash together. But other times they're more stylistic. There's examples of ligatures that are more used for branding or typography or more for effect at large sizes. But 
This is an example where we're solving a problem that's happening within the typeface. So a ligature is any kind of combination of letter forms. It's usually two, but sometimes it can be three. This is the baseline. I talked about this earlier when we were looking at descenders, and you can see this lowercase g, how there's a descender there, a stroke that comes down below that baseline, but all of the other letter forms, the capital H, the lowercase a, the lowercase n, and the lowercase d, are all aligned on this line. It makes typography feel rational. It helps us when we're reading. When the baseline isn't consistent, when it jogs or it's messed up, it can be really difficult to read copy. So baseline is that imaginary line that all of these letter forms sit on top of. Then we have the X height, another imaginary line that exists within typefaces. So the X height is how high all of the lowercase letter forms come. So again, we're seeing that the lowercase d has an ascending stroke, so it's coming above the X height. So since it's an ascender, it's doing that, but the bowl on the d is actually right there on the X height. So the X height is something that is determined within the design of a typeface. Changing the X height will give different effects to the typeface itself. So so typefaces that have a high X height are much easier to read than typefaces that have a lower X height. So this can really affect readability. It can also really affect the feeling or the look of the typeface. Then we have the cap height, another imaginary line that is determined when the typeface is designed, and that is how high all of the capital letter forms will go so that there's a rationality and a consistency to their height. Then we have the ascender line, and that is the height that all of the ascenders will go to. So there's a consistency in terms of how high all of those ascending strokes will go. And of course, there's also a descender line. It's an imaginary line that determines how far below the baseline all of the descenders will go. Then we have some basic terminology when we're discussing how you set typography. So first we have letting on the left there. Letting is the space between lines of text. So that's something that we can modify, how much space is between these lines of text. Then we have tracking at the top. Tracking is something that we can change that will determine how much space is between each of the letter forms. But when you change tracking, it changes across a word or a sentence or a paragraph. So it's where you can change the space between each of the individual letter forms across a large span of type. Where kerning down here at the bottom right is where you adjust specifically the space between two letter forms. So this is more of a micro adjustment. This happens sometimes when we set type very large in headlines. Sometimes the type will not be well spaced at a large size and we need to go in and either tighten or loosen the kerning between letter forms to make sure that the spacing feels consistent between all of it. So again, letting is the space between these lines of text. Tracking is where we change the spaces between letter forms across a line or a sentence or a paragraph. And kerning is the adjustment between letter forms, specifically between two individual letter forms themselves. Then we have what we call a drop cap, which is an enlarged letter form at the beginning of a paragraph or a story that draws the reader in. This is sometimes done with a symbol or potentially even an entire word, some kind of short word, but something like this, where there's an enlarged letter form or series of letter forms at the beginning of a story. We refer to that as a drop cap. So some other terminology. A glyph is a specific character or shape within a font. So fonts contain multiple glyphs. So there's ones that you can see on your keyboard and there's ones that you cannot. So obviously there's the full alphabet and numericals, there's things like the ampersand, at symbol, dollar symbol, but there's also things that you can't see that live in there. And all of those characters individually are glyphs, so everything from the quotation mark to the parentheses. It refers to that entire shape or character. So a glyph is just one thing. A glyph would be a lowercase a or a three. It's not referring to a specific portion of the typeface. It's just one specific character. A typeface is a set or collection of characters that share design features and are meant to work together. So some typefaces have one style and weight and other contain dozens. So we've looked at typefaces that have multiple weights and styles. So that's still all together one typeface. 
and each of those typefaces contain hundreds of glyphs or characters that allow the typeface to work and function. And then another term that sometimes gets confused, a font is the digital file format that allows us to utilize typefaces on the computer or on printers and other devices. So a specific, when we talk about the word font, it is actually the digital file. So if you are looking at prepping a file for print, you might need to include fonts to go with that file because you need to send the typefaces that you're using in their format so they can be utilized or looked at with the print job. So again, those files that are on your computer where you load typefaces are called fonts. The last thing I wanna leave with is just some thinking about as you select typefaces and work with typefaces. Anatomy can really change the way that a typeface feels. It can really change how it's perceived by the reader. And it's great when you're working with typography to think about what typefaces look like and what they feel like because it can help you make better choices as you're selecting typography. So sometimes it's valuable to be able to identify typefaces and what they're called, but I think it's more valuable in the beginning to start looking at what type makes you feel and what you think it would make the reader feel, and then what design attributes are really driving that. So here's some examples. On the left we have Archer. It's a slab serif typeface, so there's a structured quality to it. It has low contrast, so you can see all of the strokes are pretty much the same weight. And then it has these ball terminals that I think give it a sweeter, more friendly appeal. So I've written that it's sweet and structured. So if you're working on a project where you're looking for a typeface that has that blend of qualities, you know, that might be a good one for you to look at. Where the next one over, I have Univer. And here it's one of the condensed weights. So it's a little more cold. It's more utilitarian, especially if you look at the top of the A and how that downward stroke, terminating stroke, comes into the bowl. There's a closed off space that's contained above the bowl. It's open, but if you look at the way this upward stroke comes in, it's kind of containing that space. So it has a more cold and utilitarian feeling. Some of that's driven by the fact that it's a condensed typeface, but this has a different feeling than Archer that we were looking at on the left. Then we go three from the left. This is Gotham. And Gotham has a much more friendly and open feeling. It's also a sans serif, but we're looking and seeing that it's not as condensed, which is partly what's making it feel more friendly. But you'll also see that it's more open. Part of that is that space up at the top. You can see that there's more of an open, airy feeling as that air above that bowl can come in and out of that inward space. And on the right, we have Century Schoolbook, a very playful typeface. It has these exaggerated ball terminals, high contrast, it even has a tail on that back side of that right stroke. And it, it's more fun, it's more childish. This is something that we associate with school. And so it has this childlike quality to it that is driven partly by the way the typeface has been used, but also by the way that it's designed and the way it looks. So I think it's helpful as you're selecting typefaces to think about these attributes. It'll help you really decide what typefaces will be correct for the projects that you're working on and how they will connect and identify by the different audiences that will be really looking and absorbing your work.